Joining us today to help us review 12 Years a Slave uh, is a special guest. He is the editor and chief film critic for City Arts, a Strauss Media publication in New York. Armand White, welcome back to the Slash Filmcast. Armand, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking me on. Thanks for ha- uh, joining us, Armand. Really appreciate it. Uh, for those who don't know, 12 Years a Slave, I'm just going to read the plot summary from IMDb. In the antebellum United States, Solomon Northup, a free black man from upstate New York, is abducted and sold into slavery. This is the third film by director Steve McQueen, or at least the third widely released one, uh, the first two being Hunger and Shame. And uh, a lot of Oscar buzz, a lot of positive reviews for this film. So uh, very eager to dive into it with you, gentlemen. Devendra, let's begin with you. Uh, what did you think of 12 Years a Slave? Oh, I thought this film was phenomenal. Um, it's one of those rare films that as you were watching it, and it doesn't really take long for the movie to make an impact on you, but as you're watching it, you could tell that what you're watching is something that's going to be monumental and is going to sort of reverberate through the ages. Um, it's a difficult to watch film, and I feel like that's the main complaint people are taking away from it. Um, but I also think its depiction of suffering is, um, is unique. And that's something that Steve McQueen has kind of been dealing with uh, with all of his films so far, with hunger, with shame. I think this film is the best uh, combination of Steve McQueen's own talents because he's a great visual artist, but also uh, like bringing his talents to subject matter that is tremendously uh, important too. Not to diminish any of the other films, but I just feel like you know this is this is what we were waiting for Steve McQueen to make. Um, just a tremendous film all around, and she would tell it to you for his performance. It's just astounded me. Um, so much of this film takes place within his eyes. Uh, there's a scene later on in the movie where it's nothing but Chiwetel just staring off into space. And you see a glimmer of something. And that, that affected me more than any big dramatic uh, you know, scenes, um, any big dramatic moments uh, in film this year. And it was, just, it was just astounding to me. So, yeah, I love the film. I think it's a very important film, too. And I'm glad that this particular story is being told because, uh, tw- you know, slave narratives, we see them. You know, there are a few out there. There are some well-known ones like uh, Frederick Douglass's. But this particular story and the injustice of it, I think, really hammers home just the insanity of slavery and that this particular culture that we were going through in America. So, yeah, a tremendous film, in my opinion. A lot of films about slavery mm-hmm. are kind of told from the perspective of white people. I mean, even yeah, uh, yeah. a movie like Lincoln or a movie like uh, well, Lincoln's Amistad. an inter- Lincoln's an interesting one too, right? Because there was there was really very little depiction of slavery in that film. Right. That was a film entirely about slavery that was so far removed from it. It was almost an academic look at you know, uh, it's sort of like a film academically looking at slavery. But yeah, Amistad is another one, too. right? Both films by Steven Spielberg, incidentally, yeah. but. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting that there aren't that many films from the perspective of uh, a slave, and uh, you know th- there are there's of course like Roots and other films, right, but right. it just in recent memory there hasn't been one that's in my opinion quite this impactful. Uh, I agree with you completely, Divinder. I thought this is a remarkable film, uh, amazing performances all around, and incidentally, like a weird thing to note is that in my opinion, this is Steve McQueen's most accessible work so far. It, it oh, has kind of a conventional uh, or as conventional as it can be for a period piece like this narrative, and right. uh, some amazing performances all around, including uh, from uh, Michael Fassbender, who plays kind of an evil slave master. Mm-hmm. The, the way some of the sort of scenes play out and the way that black people are subjugated in this film, mm-hmm. I thought was a powerful testament to kind of this ugly chapter of American history. Like the way that Michael Fassbender will just lean on a slave's head as though he were a piece of furniture and the slave can't do anything about it. It's, it's, just, it's like little touches like that throughout the movie that make you realize the horrifying injustice of this institution. So uh, I really thought the movie was very powerful. It moved me, uh, almost a life-changing experience just for how, how sort of intense and incredible it was. Uh, so I also really enjoyed this film as well. Armand White, uh, your thoughts on 12 Years a Slave? Well, <laughs> you guys know I don't agree. <laughs> but... Uh, and who, and who am I to argue what is your life-changing experience? 
but it was not that for me. Uh, I just I don't agree with I don't agree with most of what you guys just said. Although I although I hear your enthusiasm for the film, um, but uh, let me start here. Uh, I I don't agree, David, when you said that. Uh, suggested that Amistad was from a white person's, a white character's point of view. Uh, I, I would suggest to you guys that all of the, that both movies, Amistad as well as 12 Years a Slave, is mm-hmm. from its filmmaker's point of view. Uh, I don't think they're the kinds of narrative that actually privilege the perspective of a single character. And, uh, first of all, and then I think it's, it's important also to realize that uh, what's wrong with a movie about slavery if it was from a white character's point of view, because slavery in the United States, slavery in, in world history, is also the story of white people as well as black people. Sure. Uh, the truth can come out through that. Uh, you don't get extra credit just because your narrative may privilege a black character. Uh, so, in watching uh, 12 Years a Slave, I, I have to say that I come to 12 years, I came to 12 Years a Slave uh, having seen other movies about slavery that I cannot forget because I think they were, some of them were superior cinematic achievements. And I'll, I'll mention two just to remind you guys. Uh, Amistad, for one. Yep. And, and Jonathan Demme's magnificent Beloved, which nobody seems to remember. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> huh. yeah. Very pow- a very powerful film about the institution of slavery, about the experience of slavery, and more importantly, Perhaps it, it may be even, in my opinion, the greatest film, American film, to deal with slavery because it's actually about the lingering psychological effects of slavery. The actual story in Beloved is a, is a post-bellum story, and so it is indeed about the effects of slavery with some flashbacks to the slave period, of course. But in that sense, it, it's the most sophisticated film that's been made about slavery since almost that. So oh. I, com- I come to 12 Years a Slave with Amistad and Beloved foremost in my mind. And for me, 12 Years of Slavery, 12 Years a Slave doesn't live up to those films. Instead, it's, it's, it's something, it does something other than, than those two films did. Mm-hmm. And what it does differently from Amistad and Beloved is it takes, I think it takes a, a detached uh, artistic perspective perspective on the history of slavery and uh and by the way i think i think the you, you mentioned you mentioned just as a description of steve mcqueen how yeah 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 a great a great visual artist mm-hmm. and i just want to respond to that saying you know the word artist is what is what they call a gift word uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a word that you that's a word that you use to refer to someone as a as a recognition of their achievement in a in a, in a particular field uh, I prefer to speak, think of Steve McQueen as someone who makes films, makes gallery insta- installations, uh, makes museum videos. I wouldn't call him an artist yet as a gift <laughs> term. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, and, 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 and so so my point is he's making an art thing with 12 Years a Slave. Uh, and, and as I watch it, I'm, I'm, I feel like as with, as with Hunger, as with Slave, I'm watching an abstract artistic representation of ideas connected mm-hmm. to its subject. I'm not watching a film that I think the filmmaker has any great emotional feeling for. I'm watching something that's very detached. And that's the beginning of my lack of enthusiasm for the film. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> as the film proceeded, I began to find it uh, offensive and repulsive. And we start there. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. Let, let, let's talk about some of those those feelings then. I mean, in, in terms of whether or not this qualifies as a work of art, uh, I would say that, from my perspective, it has many of the elements of a film, uh, which is to say <laughs> that there are actors playing specific characters. There is some sort of uh, narrative momentum to it, I found. There is some growth uh, within these characters, that the characters change over time and learn things. Um, so, so to me, I'm a little bit puzzled by this idea that it doesn't have, you know, the, the hallmarks of a, a, right. a great film. Um, 
And I actually thought that the emotional journey that the main character goes through, Solomon Northup, to be very profound. I mean, he goes through this entire gamut of that partially that one would expect, which is that at first there's this kind of overarching sense of uh, righteous indignation at this injustice that's been subjected that he's subjected to, and then as time goes on, he figures out ways to adapt to his situation, right. uh, but realizes that he must compromise his humanity in certain ways in order to do that. Uh, and I just thought that was uh, was really compelling that that the movie challenges your notion of hope. Uh, in this situation, just mm-hmm. as the character's uh, you know sense of hope is challenged as well, and and so that the the way the movie brings you into that identification, I thought was pretty pretty interesting. Um, yeah, my, my big takeaway, Dave and Armand, is that uh, this film is really about the inhumanity of slavery, and yeah. I think it's really interesting too because yeah, at the beginning of the film, you see Solomon uh, Northrop, you see his you know idyllic life just like they have a nice house in uh in you know um, a suburb outside of new york city uh you know he has a beautiful family his life is going well and to me that glimpse of a great life for an african-american living in that time in america uh, for, for one that's rare in film um but to see that deconstructed and to see like him strip bare and the elements of slavery just working on him to strip away his humanity uh basically like destroying this man that that was profound to me i think that was a really uh, compelling story and something that we i don't think we've seen too much in slave narratives um and maybe there's some other films out there i i'm going with the ones i've seen so yeah amistad roots i haven't seen beloved unfortunately um i don't know if it's worthwhile to argue you know if steve mcqueen is an artist or not i am the sort of person that has a pretty lax definition of that any for me any expression of creativity um can be defined art in many ways yada yada Uh, but yeah to what you're saying uh armin like i i kind of do agree that steve mcqueen with his other work does take this detached uh very artistic look at certain things uh dave i know you love um hunger that's a film that you know when i saw it i really i really wanted to get into it but the way that story was depicted actually kept me removed from it like that film the for me the art of hunger was more important than the subject matter of hunger or the story of hunger you know there there's a scene in that movie of somebody mopping down a hallway that lasts several minutes, right. right? And like, I get it. Sure, you don't. You don't need to do this. You know, this isn't a museum installation, like you're saying, Armin. Um, and with uh, shame, like I, I thought that was a beautifully told story and a really compelling performance by Michael Fassbender. But at the end of the day, that was a pretty simple story, at least to me. Like this guy is struggling with sex addiction. Movie, you know that that was kind of it. <laughs> right. Whereas this one is. Is just tremendous because it it, ta- it basically tears this character apart, and he has to build himself back up with the scraps of uh, I don't know the vestiges of uh, civilization that he has, his ability to write, uh, his his ability to think and reason. I think even more than his uh, you know, purported masters, like that's all powerful to me, uh, and that's why it was a really compelling film for me. Just because we haven't really seen this sort of story, and we haven't seen slavery completely destroy somebody who has been fully formed, I guess. Yeah. And well, go, go ahead, Armin. So, mm-hmm. I was going to say, I think, it's, I think it's important, though, that before, before we give Steve McQueen uh, the, the laurel of artist, and really, I, 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 I really meant that simply as retort, <laughs> but before we give him the laurel of artist, I think, I think you guys need to, <laughs> need to challenge it with uh, some other films by other artists, other filmmakers about the subject, so that, so that you don't think that he's done something so unusual or so mm-hmm. innovative or, so, or really so, or even so effective or so powerful. Yeah, I mean, all those I films. It, it, mm-hmm. it, would, it, be, it would be helpful to you, as well as, as well as a great artistic experience, to know Beloved. And also to know a Charles Burnett film that I, I left off my list, a film about slavery called Night John, that came out just about the same year as mm-hmm. as Amistad. Uh, these films, I think, uh, are a set of standard that Steve McQueen doesn't rise to, and I, and part of the reason I think he doesn't rise to it is because he doesn't he doesn't really he's not really invested in the subject so much as he is in his in his own his own art art making and. And that's important when you when you think about the way the narrative is constructed in Twelve Years a Slave. 
Mm-hmm. I did never, I never found Solomon Northup to be a to be a credible character, or what happened to him to necessarily be believable. And that's because, to me, the narrative in the film it's, it's an art, it's art narrative, the art thing narrative, but it's it so closely follows the pattern of, as I suggested in my review, of kind of torture porn. I think what happens to Solomon Northup is so predetermined um, that. You know something. You know something bad is awaiting this guy. Let's just see how bad it gets. Let's just see if it's going to go the Eli Roth route, which I think it, it really did. Then, uh, because to look at it in kind of realistic historical terms, uh, there are things about. I have questions about who Solomon North is. I have questions about his his naivete in the society of his time. That that the setup in the film doesn't answer. Doesn't satisfy for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do see Steve McQueen having an art concept and and devoting himself to that concept and working towards the towards showing us the worst things that could happen to a human being in America at that time, and that's part of his art project. I don't think it it deserves the kind of uh, the kind of laurels it's received as as, an, as a depiction of the horrors of slavery. So so it seems like there's a few. Uh issues you have with the film, Armin, and let me see if I can try to unpack them. Let me know if I'm off base here, okay? But one of them seems like uh, th- this film is based on a true story, but it sounds like you're saying that the way this true story was rendered on film was not particularly believable to you, just because of uh, the way the characters behaved or because of the way the plot developed. Is that, is that accurate to say? Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe it, and filmmaking did not convince me of it as I watched it, except, except for, you know, the, the two, uh, two plus hours that we suspend our disbelief and, and watch what's going on on screen. But it didn't really, it didn't move me, it didn't, it didn't capture my, my imagination uh, in terms of being a, a true depiction of the slavery experience. Okay, so... And, and, uh, that, and, that, that, and that's, that's because uh, there, I think there's an important point that's gotten lost in, in so many people's enthusiasm for the film. And it starts with the idea that it's based on a true story. Uh, mm-hmm. Perhaps, though. So. Uh, it's based on a, on a previously published slave narrative, certainly. But that doesn't mean that what we're watching on screen is true. Sure. Uh, because what we're actually watching on screen is, is an art thing, is an artwork. It's Steve McQueen's imagination. It's Steve McQueen's theatricality. It's Steve McQueen's artsiness. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, to, sorry to bring up the name of another publication, but I, I saw a review in Time Magazine that twice <laughs> refers to 12 Years a Slave as a document. I thought, document? It's not a document. <laughs> it's, an, it's an art thing. It's, it's a total fabrication. It's an adaptation of a previously published book, but it's a fabrication. And I think some viewers need to need to get back that sophistication and realize that they're not watching something real. They're not watching something true. Mm-hmm. They're watching an art thing. An art okay. thing. Yeah, I think that is a pretty interesting point, actually, and it's been brought up a few times, which is that uh, there seems to be a kind of desire on the part of film critics or the, the movie-going audience to see a movie like 12 Years a Slave as being in some way definitive of this period of time or of right. the slavery experience. And, uh, and there's a sort of backlash to that impulse to reject that notion. I, I kind of, I can see where that backlash is coming from because, and I think you're, you're right on, Armand, in saying that we should remind ourselves that uh, there's nothing sacred about this film, that there's nothing about this film that says it's the definitive depiction of this experience and that there's probably a lot of it that is fabricated uh, and, you know, not, Perhaps mm-hmm. embellished or or not uh, not a hundred percent true to life. Uh, so so fair enough. I, I, I can understand that uh, that issue with the film. But you also talk about the torture porn elements of the film. We actually had a, uh, a listener write in in advance, uh, knowing that you would be on, uh, and who, who's read your review, uh, and actually. Uh, wrote in this, and I, so I thought I'd read this to you and see what you thought. Uh, this email comes in from Marlon from Maryland. Uh, Armin likens this movie to torture porn like Hostel and Saw, and I might be inclined to agree, but I would appreciate clarification on the definition 
of torture porn. Uh, wouldn't every film about slavery be considered torture porn? I can't think of any film about slavery that didn't feature something horrific or torturous happening to black people. Uh, couldn't you then clarify most, if not all, horror films like A Nightmare on Elm Street as torture porn? Couldn't a drama like Stephen King's Misery be considered torture porn as it is literally a person being held hostage and at times literally tortured? Uh, I'm just curious what the exact parameters of torture porn are. I'm going to end the note there, Armin, and say also, yeah, like, is torture, when you say torture porn, you're, you're sort of describing it as inherently bad, like inherently uh, lesser than other works of art. So I'm wondering if you can just kind of clarify what you mean by that. Well, I don't, I don't want to be so moralistic as to say that <laughs> porn is bad. <laughs> I don't want to say that today. Uh, maybe. <laughs> But, uh, but I, I, like, I like Marlon's note, his email, frankly. And I want to remind Marlon of, of a film by another Marlon, the great Marlon Brando, who, did, who also did a film about slavery called Burn by the Italian filmmaker uh, Gilo Pontecorvo. And unlike 12 Years a Slave, <laughs> Burn is actually about a slave uprising uh, on a sugar plantation in the Caribbean. And, uh, and it was not torture porn because it wasn't simply about... Uh, the horrors inflicted upon slaves. It was about the mentality, the, the, the almost natural political mentality of people who were slaves uh, to rebel, uh, to resist their dehumanization, and to act upon it. Uh, and that's what, made it, that was what makes Pantacorvo's burn, as well as Amistad, as well as Beloved, not torture porn. Torture porn, I, I use that phrase as a way of taking this film down a peg because everybody wants to call it a great work of art and a true document of history, which it is not. I want to knock it down a peg and, 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 and diminish it some by more truthfully relating it to a low genre, uh, not a high humanist uh, or political genre of, uh, of, of social realism or even political protest, but a genre that is done simply to to give audiences nightmares, to make audiences feel bad and squeal and giggle, and also feel good about squealing and feeling bad. I think that's what Steve McQueen's art comes down to when, you, hmm. when, I, when I look at it and when I, when I think about it. It's, it's no better than Hostel. And I think it does follow the narrative line of movies like Hostel and Saw, in, wherein you know something terrible is going to happen, so you watch to see how terrible and sure enough, Steve McQueen shows you one dreadful thing after another, and it gets worse and worse as it goes along. Uh, I said earlier about my sense of being offended and repulsed by the film, and my offense comes from the fact that this film is connecting uh, low-genre impulses, like, like in Hostel, to a very serious historical subject. And that's what I find offensive. But I think it's important. It's important to realize that this is a this is an art thing. This is a fabricated story, and that it's made by a filmmaker whose whose own interest in making films can be questioned. We don't have to accept it just because it just because it's given to us on a platter uh, from a mainstream studio in Hollywood. Uh, we have the right to question what it is Steve McQueen is interested in, and in fact to examine what he's interested in. I think the closer one examines uh, Twelve Years a Slave. It's not much interested in slavery as a as a historical uh, offense, as, 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 as a part of history, as a part of political and human history. It's more interested in Stephen McQueen's constant subjects, which are masochism, sadism, repulsion of the body, uh, dread, fear, nihilism. Those are his hmm. subjects. Not slavery. Not politics not humanism, not rebellion. <laughs> and if you look at 12 Years a Slave as the work of an individual art maker, that's what you see. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me dispute some of, uh, or let me attempt to dispute some of what you're saying here. Uh, so with regards to the reference to torture porn like Hostel and Saw, uh, I totally understand your point about the genre trappings that uh, McQueen kind of invokes here, but uh, I think the issue with the comparison to those films, the implication of using the phrase torture porn is that uh, it is uh, – you're kind of saying that the redeeming quality of this work is its, the, the, its depiction of torture or the fact that like you – know, pe pe people don't watch Hostel 
for the amazing performances and spectacular character development, put it that way, right? <laughs> right. And so when you say something like torture could, porn... One could, if, if one were, were a fan of Hostel, one might be led to say that. <laughs> that's, that's correct. That's correct. But I would say when people refer to Hostel as torture porn, when people watch Hostel, um, they are watching it to, to see the torture porn and not necessarily to see those other things that I mentioned. Whereas I feel like a film like 12 Years a Slave... Uh, you know, I, I do agree with my colleague Devinder that, in my opinion, this is finally Steve McQueen uh, reconciling the, this idea of himself as a visual artist and as a filmmaker. That he takes, he he's able to create these tableaus that serve the story rather than distract from it. Uh, and so, I, I really did think he he achieved something great here. But in terms of uh, the other elements of the film, right, like the the performances, the narrative, the character development, I referred to them a few times already. But I do think that those elements of this movie elevate it above what mm-hmm. one would refer to derisively as torture porn in a typical situation. Right. Um, uh, that's, and- just, that's just because you guys are Americans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh, we, I see let's, lots let of... Me, let me remind things. you, <laughs> Steve McQueen is not an American. Yep. And also, you guys, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys are on the West Coast? No, right? uh, East Coast. I'm on the East Coast and Dave is on the West Coast. Yeah. Oh, Dave's on the West Coast. Okay, where, yeah. where are you, Devendra? I'm in New York City, right next to you, actually. Oh, what, what, oh. Avenger, then you should know. You should know <laughs> that that Steve McQueen knows nothing about America. You should oh, know that. You should sure. know that from shame and yes. the, the misrepresentation of New York and shame. <laughs> oh no, I definitely, I definitely realize that. But you know, am I, okay. McQueen, but my main, my main yeah. point here, though, is, is, that, is that Steve McQueen. He, he is not. I don't think he is really interested in American experience or American politics. That's not the kind of art maker that he is. He is a more abstract art maker. When you, when you, when you guys relate to this movie so strongly, uh, I think that's because you are Americans and that the subject means something to you. I'm suggesting it means more to you than it does to Steve McQueen. For Steve McQueen, this is just an opportunity to get ahead in Hollywood, get bigger budgets, and and more budgets. I, I mean, uh, I'd say that's a yeah. That's a cool let's sense. not impugn the motivations of Steve McQueen. That's not impugning. That's not impugning. That's how that's how the commercial film industry works. He, he has, right, he, has right. to, he has to make a move that's going to guarantee his future in this industry, and that's I, what he has done with. That's what he's done with this mm-hmm. film. I don't know uh, if that's but, but, necessarily. But I, but I don't want to. Lose, I don't want to lose my thought on, on, right, on something right. you said, Dave, before, which which is. Uh, why? Why I think this is torture porn, and and this is a this connects to I think a larger uh, contem- point about contemporary politics. I think possibly this is the perfect time to make a torture porn movie about slavery in America, because I think we are living in an era when uh, some people have called this the the post racial era, mm-hmm. and I, for me, what what that strange term means is that we can put all racial problems in the past because we, there's no more racism. We've got, a, we've got a, an African-American person in the White House, so there is no more racism in America. All the racism is behind us. So what better film to confirm that foolish thought than a film that shows how horrible slavery was? Mm-hmm. Not, how slavery, not how slavery lingers in generations, as, as, as Beloved showed us, not how slavery is a part of our laws and institutions, as Amistad showed us, but a film that, that guarantees all the, that big nightmare was all in the past. Not only can we forget about it if we choose, but we can look at it in the past and get off on it. It's torture porn. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's the, it's, in that sense, it's the perfect movie for the post-racial age. I mean, the, the, there are a couple points here that I really want to get back to because, uh, yeah, Steve McQueen is British, but let's not pretend that he is not affected by the legacy of slavery, um, you know, due to colonialism. Like his family is Caribbean. By the way, that's also where my family is from. Uh, my family story is very different from like the black, uh, the African American, well, the black story in the Caribbean. It's very different. Um, but what's interesting about the Caribbean is that uh, the, see, it, there are so many cultures there. That's where the idea of fusion food came from, by the way, because uh, thanks to colonialism, thanks to slavery, uh, you had people of every culture there either serving as uh, servants or slaves or whatever. Uh, but that's where Steve McQueen comes out of. And uh, he has that background. He definitely has an understanding of that, I'd say, otherwise um, – 
I don't think he would have uh, he would have had such a really close eye on this film. So I'm not I'm not like yeah, just because he's British doesn't mean that he's totally removed from the slavery narrative. And the you want to think, want to think he does, and it would be nice to, it's nice to think that he does, but I, I'm not so sure. And the film doesn't make me for me the film doesn't yeah. convince me that he has any special regard for that topic. And uh, to be, mm-hmm. if I could be a little abstract, I should think that uh, being a a British citizen. That he that he would approach the subject of slavery, were he truly interested in it, in the way that Michael Apted's movie Amazing Grace did. I mm-hmm. uh, talk about how slavery impacted the British Empire and what the British Empire did about it. You know, you, have you guys seen Amazing Grace? No, I, I have not. Uh, yeah. The story of Wilberforce, Wilberforce, and how Wilberforce instituted the the British rule against slavery. I mean, if, if Steve McQueen really cared about that, about slavery as a as a subject as an issue. I mm-hmm. think he would look at it from his own perspective, because you can, which, is, which would be a British perspective, because you just can't get away from that old school teacher line. Like, <laughs> you know, well, I, uh, I'd also instead, instead he's crossed the ocean with this story because you know, right. as with shame, shame about about that dubious topic, sexual addiction, which doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, he's crossed the ocean to tell that to tell that story because it doesn't really mean anything to him. It, it, it's 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 an opportunity to to exercise his artfulness. Well, I also want to point out that this film was written by John Ridley, a guy who uh, who is uh, black and lives in America, so he definitely brings that perspective uh, to the film, okay, too. Like, okay. mm-hmm. well, all right, well, John, John Ridley is, all, is, an, is, is another problem here. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a different kind of maker from Steve McQueen. He's, oh, definitely. That, he's that an, guy, he's by an, the way. He's an, he's, an op, he's an opportunistic race hustler. <laughs> that, 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 that's a whole other element to what Steve McQueen has brought to this movie. And, but well, put yeah. those problems, put those two problems together, and put those two personalities together, and you have a very problematic film. Well, I just want to point out, like John Ridley, by the way, has a very interesting uh, work history because this is a guy who used to write for uh, Martin and Fresh Prince, and then went on to do some movies. I think he has a story credit on Th- Three Kings as well. He, uh, co- I think, he co-wrote Undercover Brother. But then to have him go on and do something like this, where I feel like you would never know that it was the same man who had done all that slightly lowbrow stuff. Oh yes, um, you would. Oh yes, I would. <laughs> I, would. I, I, I see lowbrowness throughout this film, and I and I see a kind, I see a different kind of opportunism uh-huh. that's apparent to me in the screenplay. Uh, I don't, Such I don't, as? I don't trust the script as, as written. And, like, and I'm wondering what, what specifically you're finding is lowbrow, just because um, like the, the idea of calling this torture porn is definitely, you were saying uh, you kind of want to knock the movie down a peg. It definitely does do that, but I also think it's kind of unfair because this film does restrain itself in certain situations. There is, um, I think, uh, there, yeah, there's a rape scene in this film, which I think a lot of films which don't quite know how to handle their narrative or how they want to portray certain events, there's a rape scene in this film that is very subdued, but I think horrifically subdued. Like, that tells you something more than if it was totally graphic and totally violent. And there's one tremendous violent scene towards the end of this film, but I do think that served a definite purpose. Like, the, everything going on, uh, especially, again, Solomon Northup's eyes in that scene, like, that tells you something. I'm just saying we can't, just because it has some of these more brutal elements, doesn't mean we can... it necessarily devalues the film like yeah, I, I also want to point out one other thing uh i just want to make sure it is not lost in terms of my own opinion uh <laughs> on this movie which is that uh we talk about it or i should say armand is referring to how detached the film see uh, seems and how in steve mcqueen's style it is and how detached it is and how the camera seems to just uh be you know it's not uh this is not like guerrilla style filmmaking. This right, is not like right. handheld. You're right in the people's faces. This is very kind of the camera is far away. The frames are meticulously composed. And in my opinion, that detachedness, that detachedness, however, whatever the noun form is, serves the movie's themes. Right. Um, mm-hmm. There is this. There are uh, a lot of close-ups too, by the way. Like uh, a lot of close-ups, well, yeah. right? But but I, just. I agree, uh, I agree. I agree. But we probably don't agree that the movie's themes are masochism and sadism. Correct. Correct. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, it's true. It's true that there is a lot of violence in the film, and a lot of it is very graphic. Um, but I will say a few things. First of all, 
uh, in, in response to what you said, Armin, number one, what Devendra said about how the movie actually isn't as explicit as it could be in certain situations. And so that's to the film's credit, in my opinion. Number two, I would say that, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily agree with you that the movie's main function is to mm-hmm. show us that slavery is a removed element from American society. I got quite the opposite impression. When I watched this movie, I thought to myself, uh, my goodness, like this was so horrifying that a, a black person's rights could be removed from him at the whims of white people and that this was only a couple hundred years ago. How can American society have been expected to recover in this time? Mm-hmm. That was my reaction, not that, oh, that's so comically uh, you know, over the top and violent that of course we're not in that era today. I thought, I did, wow, this is say, a legacy we will comically. have to live with comically. for. I did not say comically. Sure, it, sure. I think it's certainly, I do think it's over the top, but I did not say comically. And I also have to say, David, that's your, that's your inference. Yes. I don't think that anywhere in the film does Steve McQueen or does Steve McQueen suggest that this is a analogy for contemporary American society. Nowhere. But that's, that's, what, that's, what, you, that's what you infer. And I also Co- suggest correct. And your a inference. lot of people want to, want to infer in the post-racial age. Well, your your inference is that that the movie serves to to separate us from uh, from our the the sort of past of racial conflict that we've had, whereas I'm saying it doesn't. I, I, like that's mm-hmm. that's my inference, right? But I mean, at least you can uh, argue it. I think okay, there is. Okay, you're you're entitled to your inference, but but I, mm-hmm. I I would caution you to say that I would caution you about thinking that that's Steve McQueen's that was his motivation in making the film. I, mm-hmm. I think not. And I think as, as, as you examine the way the film is made, uh, it just becomes apparent that he, he's simply interested in, he is interested in examining forms of masochism, forms of sadism, forms of psychological brutality as well. Not, not just graphic physical brutality, but psychological brutality, which sure. is the essence of, essence of the rape scene, which is where, you know, there's no, it's not an explicit sex scene, but it's plenty brutal and it's, it's ugly and it suggests all kinds of psychological perversion. And, and he's, he has skill as a filmmaker, McQueen does. I'm not saying mm-hmm. he doesn't. And his skill goes towards that, towards showing us kinds of perversion, kinds of brutality, kinds of masochism and sadism. He's, he can do that effectively. And third time out, I guess he ought to be able to do it effectively. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, think, I, think we, we ought to, I think we ought to, ought to understand... Or I suge- I'm suggesting to you guys, I, I guess, a, a kind of auteurist perspective on this. Sure. And understanding that, that these films don't simply emanate from, don't simply emanate from the culture, not, not purely, but they are the works of, an in- of the individual who signed them, and that they express the interests and the personalities of the individual who signed a particular film. And if we understand, and we should well understand what Steve McQueen is interested in from his previous work, then we see what he's interested in here as well. And it's the same thing. It's just that uh, I think he, he rooks Americans into thinking that he cares about, about their history, uh, about their politics. I don't think he's a political artist in that sense. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I think he, sh- he sure knows how to sell it politically if necessary, <laughs> a, lesson, a lesson he's no, no doubt learned from Harvey Weinstein. I do feel like I'm a little bit in between you guys just because, yeah, um, Dave, like there's definitely a statement here on slavery uh, as and what it means in the American culture. But I also think, Armin, like the fact that this movie does slightly remove itself, it turns the slave narrative into a tale of survival and to, I think, one that is easily relatable. I actually found this movie, uh, I saw it, you know, a couple of weeks after seeing Gravity. And the experience of both films I found to be kind of similar too, because they are all about people in these like just hopeless, completely hopeless situations where they, there's no reason they'll survive. Like there's a 99% chance they will die or perish or something in the situation they're in. And through, you know, the grace of something, they find a way out. Um, so I find that journey very similar to Gravity. I just thought that was interesting to note. Um, but yeah, I think it's also, it's powerful that this film can 
kind of uh, separate itself a little from the slave narrative and tell a greater story. Because one of the things that's bothered me a little about some of the uh, you know some of the other films that try to depict slavery is that they try to be self-important. They try to be all about this one thing. Uh, where the big problem is that slavery, you know. Um, I think it was like the biggest driving force or one of the biggest driving forces in the American economy at the time. It's like even the people in the North who didn't hold slaves, everybody in America benefited from this whole you know uh, notion of human trafficking. And I think this movie kind of shows that too because we see it in the other characters. We see it in the slave owners, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's, um, you know, his character – is really interesting because it's like he means well. He really wants to do well by these people, but he still buys slave. He, he still, you know, separates families. And at the end of the day, he's just as complicit as, um, you know, the as uh, what's his face's character, Michael Fassbender's Michael Fassbender's character, who's horrific and horrifically bad. But I think you see how everybody is participating in this. Everybody is benefiting from this. I like the kind of uh, we get one scene with a, a female black slave owner. And that was just interesting to me, how it's just kind of blasé. The how Alfred just, Woodward scene, you mean? Yes, yes. And it's just, it's kind of a throwaway scene. And uh, I was listening to John Ridley, by the way, on the Q&A podcast with our show friend, uh, Jeff Goldsmith. That's a great interview. Uh, but he was talking about how that, that just, that whole scene stemmed from a throwaway mention uh, in the book. But it's a really interesting look at the idea that, yes, um, there were black slave owners as well, and they were just as complicit in it, or at least there's a there's a sort of idea where, you know, you participate in it, you are well aware of how, you know, messed up all of this is, but that's the way the world is, and you kind of just fit your way in it. So, I well, don't know, I took, a, I took a lot away from this film, definitely not just I'm the sorry, I'm sorry soul. that I, I can't, I can't yep. agree with it. I can't agree, I cannot agree with any of that. <laughs> I think uh, as far as depicting the political economy of slavery, that this film is absolutely superficial and doesn't really get into the political economy of slavery and 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 by the way this this is the most self-important film i've seen in all of 2013 <laughs> more self-important film than this but but back to the political economy issue how slavery worked as an institution and who benefited benefited from it is not shown in this movie it's what you may know from history but it's not shown in this movie and if you want to and if you want to see a movie that deals with that You've got to see Amistad and take it seriously. You've got to see Beloved and take it seriously. And you also, you also have to see Charles Burnett's Night John. Not, Charles Burnett's Night John deals with figures. <laughs> it deals with the actual economy of slavery. Uh, this is a superficial film on, on, that, on that issue. Uh, but, but see, I, see, I think you guys, you guys bring to it what you know. We have to bring what we know to every movie experience. But don't mm-hmm. give the movie, don't give the movie what you know if the movie isn't actually expressing what you know. Uh, it's a superficial film on slavery. It's a very detailed, skillful depiction of sadomasochism. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the it's being sold as a commercial film, which I guess is probably part of what. what was meant earlier when it said that this is the Queen's most accessible movie. Is it really, I wonder? Uh, it's being sold as a commercial film, but I don't know how many people are understanding it as a movie about sadomasochism, because mm-hmm. that's Steve McQueen's theme. <laughs> Steve McQueen is not, he's not Stanley Kramer. He's not Steven Spielberg. He's interested in psychological perversion, and I think we'd have a better film audience if they were able to appreciate 12 Years a Slave that way, and also understand how it simply exploits the history of slavery, rather than dealing with its political economy or, or the spirituality behind the slave experience. That's nowhere to be found in the movie. Hmm, I, or rather, I, rather it's, it's, there, it's there superficially, again, it's superficial. But it, it doesn't really deal with, with, slavery, with slavery as a historical event. I am curious as to whether or not uh, the the depi- so they obviously depict really violent acts in this film, and I mean, are you saying that there is no place for graphic depiction of violent acts in films about slavery, or are you saying that it's unnecessary? Or are you saying that films that avoid this but still manage to make an impact on you are superior? Uh, like, I'm still not 100 percent sure why you feel like the the uh, you know, the violence in this movie is unnecessary or 
I didn't say, I didn't say it was unnecessary. All, all I'm really doing is rejecting this movie. I reject okay. it. Okay. I reject it almost flat out. <laughs> uh, be, and partly because, partly because there are other movies about slavery that nobody's mentioning. Uh, you know, there, I think there, there is a problem in the, in the, uh, in, 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 in the commercialism of films where, where new movies are received as if there were no other films before it and people accept how the films are being sold to them rather than looking at them critically and by looking at them critically, uh, you know, uh, holding them up against films in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all movies about slavery deal with violence. Uh, there, there, there's, a, there's a wonderful comedy called Skin Game with James Garner and Lou Gossett from 1971. Uh, it's funny, but it's also violent. Uh, we, we, haven't, we haven't mentioned Richard Fleischer's Mandingo, an extraordinary film which comes from a low genre, but really being being part of of seventies seventies uh, political ferment, uh, actually says says a lot of important things about black rebellion, and there's much violence in Mandingo. However, the difference between Mandingo and Skin Game and Twelve Years a Slave is that the violence in those earlier films tells us something about the humanity of the characters and how they rise above it. This is essential. Uh, Steve McQueen is simply interested in how he, the human body, the human being, can be brought low. And that's what's offensive to me. It's not just the violence. It's the way the violence is used. Uh, Steve McQueen, not being American, I don't think is, is able to connect or relate to how the brutal slave experience just so happened to lead to uh, black rebellion, black spiritual optimism, and endurance and survival. He's not interested in that. And in those terms, the movie completely falsifies an important aspect of the black slave experience, as well as the white slave experience, too. He doesn't deal with that. He doesn't have to deal with that. I'm just, if he doesn't want to, I'm just saying we've got, we've got to understand that and realize that he's made a superficial somewhat fraudulent film. Hmm. Well, aside from the fraudulent part, I actually think that uh, that was that was a pretty good point. I think that's uh, you know, I, I fair point about that. Sure. I, I don't think I agree with uh, the point, but I think like you know, I, I can totally understand why someone would interpret the violence of this film as being uh, what you just said it was. So, mm -hmm. um, but let's talk about something we can agree on, Armand, <laughs> which is I think that we all like the score of this movie. Is that correct? Sure. <laughs> well. I wouldn't say sure that way, <laughs> but uh, I, thought, I thought I thought it was an effective score. It's, it's, it's Hans Zimmer's year, you know. It's an effective score, but not as effective as the score for Man of Steel. Oh, uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, and I did think that he actually borrowed a lot from his own work in Inception, oh, actually. as always. Yeah. I think he, yeah, I was just about to say as always. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but really, uh, not, an atypical score for this movie. Uh, just it, it's very percussive. It's mm -hmm. very intermittent. It, it comes in like not when you expect it to, and it sort of punctuates certain moments, gives them an extra oomph that I thought mm -hmm. uh, was pretty good. Well, I also so. really enjoyed the use of silence in this film, too, because especially in something like this, like that, that is often more powerful than any sort of film score, right? Because you really want to focus on what's going on on the screen. Right, definitely. Mm -hmm. So... It Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Durant. Back to what we were saying before. I think like you can uh, you could definitely argue on the accuracy of this film, especially how it's uh, you know, is it actually everything Solomon Northup went through. Uh, but I do think this film does deserve some credit for actually getting the story out there. You know, the book uh, Twelve Years a Slave is available for free online because uh, it's it's way past any royalties at this point. <laughs> like there are no rules for it. People can actually go read it, and I actually think this is. Uh, that's kind of a big deal because this narrative is so interesting and just I think it's important to actually go back and actually read what happened. The idea that, you know, I, I feel like this is something that should have been taught at least in schools or mentioned or something. I've, I've never heard about this story before this film came about. And I think that's true for a lot of people. So for getting this narrative out there, for telling Solomon Northup's story, I give it some credit, you know, like – Despite how accurate it may or may not be, it leads oh, people to the book. I, I can't. I can't give that much credit. Remember, this film, the, the book, the book was in print before the movie came out. Yes, and yes. The new ver, and the new version, for hundreds of years, yeah. versions of it that come out are simply what used to be called tie-ins. 
and this happens anyway. Well, I'm, I'm not saying the tie-ins. I'm saying it is online. The text is you can just go get it for free because okay, they're, okay, but let, okay, yeah. but let me go for let me go further. I, I you know, I don't, I, I'm not crazy about this as a as a slave narrative, frankly, and I don't think it's that important to know. Uh, I think it's more important to know uh, Frederick Douglass, and that's certainly taught in schools. I think sure. God knows I think it's more important to know, to speak of fabrication, it's more important to know Mark Twain's putting Head Wilson. Right. Uh, those things are important. And I got to say to you guys, and, and, I, and you, you better understand me, it's more important to know beloved Amistad, <laughs> uh, Skin Game, Night John, Burn, Mandingo, you, and, and Amazing Grace. You guys got to know these things. You got to know these things because, because you know, con artists... <laughs> like Steve McQueen, like Lee Daniels, are, are on the ascent. And you have to be armed against them. Uh, <laughs> it's, too, it's, too, it's too easy for them to, to you know, just to, to poke holes in, in, your, in, in, your, in your sensitivities, sensibilities. You have to be armed against them. And the way to be armed against them is to have a better knowledge of film history. You guys got to know those other movies. You must see Beloved. You must see Night John. You must see Mandingo. You have to know what those filmmakers, done, all done by smart people, mm-hmm. whether or not you like their other films, you have to know how they treated this issue. Steve McQueen's not the first. John Ridley's not the first. You've got to know them. I mean, it, it, to, it, it, to it, some and I, 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 prom- I promise you <laughs> knowing those films will affect your response to something like 12 Years a Slave. To a certain degree, I agree. Yeah, you know, I think that is a really interesting thing. Like your knowledge of a film or film history does kind of change how you react to film. But at the same time, art has to stand on its own. Like that's something that I, I think has been essential for me. Like we don't judge all books uh, based on uh, everything that's happened that's been written before. We don't judge a painting dep- based on everything I've seen well, before. Were, I think that's unfair if you don't, to the particular. If you don't, work. Then you have no basis of judgment at all. Uh, I only think way, that's, the, that's the only way to judge to actually actually critique something is by comparing it to something else you have you have to know that or, or, else, or, else, or else everything is great i mean at the same time so i wonder like how would we have judged you know the very first films or the very first paintings like there is an essential element to every piece of art that is unique to its own like it's trying to do something on its own and i do think there are things that we can judge we can judge you know how well acted this film is we can judge like how the narrative is framed we can judge like how it's all put together and the themes this movie is trying to explore i i I just think it's a little unfair to judge every movie based on what came before you can definitely mention it but it it's not not, well you know i don't agree with that it's not unfair i know i know it's the, only, it's the only way that you can judge something, frankly. Otherwise, everything is great or everything is good. I don't, I, I don't, I don't subscribe to the on-its-own-term point of view. Uh, we, we, on, we only know what good is by having seen it already. And, sure. That applies to, to movies, to books, to music, to everything. Um, unless, unless there's a rare instance of something that's of a, of a genre, of an mm-hmm. art form, that's innovative, that is indeed new. And film ain't new. And Steve McQueen isn't doing anything new. Uh, we, 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 have to, we have to know how to judge him, not, not judge him by 20th Century Fox's terms or the Oscars' terms, but judge him by the terms, judge this movie by the terms of other movies dealing with the same subjects, dealing with the same themes. And well, that's, how, that's how you know. Despite our uh, significant disagreements about 12 Years a Slave, I actually do agree with a lot of what you're saying. And honestly, Armand, you know, a significant part of the reason why I personally enjoy having you on is to hear uh, all of the films that we should be watching. Uh, and so I, I do appreciate that uh, as an education. I say that completely seriously. Um, so... Yeah, I, I mean, that being said, you know, we can't deny that 12 Years a Slave is a film that profoundly affected us. Uh, and maybe if we had the context of other better films, we may not feel the same way. I don't <laughs> know not, if not, that's the not. case, look, look, look. but I'm willing to acknowledge that that's a possibility. Go ahead. Okay, okay so, so let me come at that from another point of view. Because otherwise, if you don't have, to, if you don't have the... You have, to, you have to judge films, works of art, I think from two perspectives. One is you need to know what came before it. And also you need to examine your own personal responses. You know, why mm-hmm. am I, why am right. I offended by this? Or why am I moved by this? Uh, that, 
those two things are are are, are essential to criticism. You no, have to definitely. Know what came before, and you have to examine your own responses. Otherwise, as I said before, everything is great, and what happens eventually <laughs> is that then, then uh, as time passes, you forget the thing that you thought was great before, mm-hmm. because a year ago. Wasn't everybody saying that Jane Quinn Chain was just the greatest thing since ice cream? Nope. I dealt with slavery. Well, not me, and now, and now, yes. and now, now I, I haven't read maybe I haven't read anywhere in a discussion the Twelve Years of Slave any uh, <laughs> much mention of Django Unchained. I, you know, Armin, like I would love to get you back at some point to talk about Django because I think that's very important. I remember everybody throwing praise all over that movie, and I did not care for it. And today, yeah, it's true. Nobody is really talking about it anymore. Yeah, that's I a very mean, good point. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we got we got to fight this, like, this this tendency to just right. praise, heap all kinds of praise and commendation upon what's new, and then forget about it a few days later <laughs> or a few months later. And I do agree too. Like the idea of knowing your own experiences and how that affects you—that's important as well. Like for me, stories about injustice just really get to me. In this film, like I realized by the end of this film that I had my hands, my yeah, my fists were curled up throughout the entire film, and I didn't realize that uh, until the very end. Just because it's this movie lays injustice upon injustice on Solomon Northup, and it doesn't really let up um, until the very end. I do feel like. Maybe we should dive into spoilers for a couple things. Do you think that's worthwhile, Dave? Uh, I think actually we should probably wrap up pretty soon. We're getting close to an hour at this point, so okay, that's but, fine. But, I want to talk but, about but some let, of the let end me, scenes. Let me, let me jump on that and say I, I personally don't like movies where where the lead character is is browbeaten, is beaten down constantly, mm-hmm. constantly, constantly. Uh, I need. I, I I would like some uplift. <laughs> Unless it's an absolutely true documentary <laughs> depiction, right. I want some uplift, and and that's an important aspect of slave narratives. I mean, slave narratives are not still with us because they were all about masochism and 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 degradation. Slave narratives matter because they are about rising up. They are about optimism. I you know and, you know people are quick to say that Steven Spielberg is sentimental. I haven't seen anything this year more sentimental than the last scene of 12 years. Oh. It's to- to- for me, it was totally unearned. And <laughs> like, what? It's, like, it's like, can I say this? What the fuck? Are you kidding? <laughs> After all of that, this, you know, the sentimental homecoming, it's just get the hell out of here. Uh, th- this is not acceptable. And, and, to me, and to me, when I see a movie where, where the protagonist is constantly, constantly beaten down, I feel manipulated that way. I feel manipulated mm-hmm. by that. I feel like I haven't been given a chance to breathe, and neither has the protagonist. And right. this is simply because of de- we're dealing with a with a porn torturer <laughs> who simply wants to get the worst feelings out of us. And by the way, this is that this we you know, don't have the time, I guess. But this is a crucial aspect of the art world, meaning mm-hmm. the museum world. The museum world is is largely a place where negative nihilistic expressions are encouraged. That's where Steve McQueen is from. Mm-hmm. I said before, he's not Stanley Kramer. He's not Steven Spielberg. He's not interested in uplift. He's interested in ugly. And, and mm-hmm. that's what he gives us, ugly. He doesn't give us uplift. He doesn't give us rebellion. He doesn't give us politics. He gives us masochism and sadism. Oh, the, the movie does... I'll just, I'll just put a spoiler tag at the beginning of the review, so feel free to... Okay, Just get into it. That's totally fine. Um, I will say, like, yes, we do see Solomon Northup beaten down quite a bit in this film, but we do see the glimmers of somebody trying to rebel and fight back against this. We see him questioning the very reality of him being, you know, chained up and stuck in that uh, cell early on. Um, we see him do things uh, like there's a point where he almost runs away. And then he runs into these people hanging a couple runaway slaves. And I think he realized at that point probably not such a good idea we see him trying to do his best to write something and to kind of get the word out so he can get some help first time that didn't really work out so well but the second time it definitely did um i i I think it's interesting just because this film depicts somebody trying to rebel through their intellect through their knowledge and that's not necessarily something we've seen before because yes most other uh, slave narratives don't really uh show characters who are that well educated you know uh, maybe the frederick Douglass narrative is a little different but it's also very rare so i found that to be kind of interesting and just a very different look at this well, and if about if that, the, mm-hmm. if you call those instances rebellion, I'd have to say that those are very weak examples of rebellion. They, sure, they aren't they aren't effective, and I think they're very contrived as well. 
yes, I dare say they're contrived, because who <laughs> knows how much of the Solomon North narrative was not embellished by the white guy who actually wrote it. Uh, it's it's uh, black guy very much wrote. contrived by John Ridley and, and Steve McQueen. Yeah. But, and, and, but you know, if we're going to, if we're, I don't believe in spoilers, by the way, when you talk okay. about art. But if we're going to go into spoiler land, you got to <laughs> say the entire thing with Patsy and the soap is flat out unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, that, that's just, that's just an opportunity for, for abuse and brutality. Uh, in, in well, what part of, of it did you of not credible, believe? In terms of credible individual behavior or, incre- or credible uh, plantation protocol, it's absurd what happens to her over a bar of soap. Absolutely absurd. I mean, I would but, say the but, whole... But I think, I think see, people forget about that because what happens to her because of this bar of soap is so horrendous. Right. Uh, it's, it's just, but it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh Given given the logic where where but whereby Solomon's chance to gives up on his chance to escape, uh, if Patsy really wanted to kill herself, there was a way to do it. She had many opportunities to do it, <laughs> but that would that would have prevented Steve McQueen from having his ultimate ultimate torture scene. Well, I, I disagree with pretty much everything you said there. I mean, what, so even if that isn't standard plantation protocol, isn't part of the point of that scene to show that. Uh, that punishment for such a seemingly minor infraction, punishment of that degree was possible with no repercussions. I mean, I think that that's you know, well, you well, know worth worth it's, noting. It's, and then the other thing is that uh, Fassbender is insane too. Yeah, so. Fassbender is insane. Like I think like the character dynamics that have been established up to that point make that scene totally plausible. And uh, as for her not killing herself, I mean, yes, that is. Logical for us to say that she'd be better off dead, perhaps, yeah. but... Well, that's what she says. Yeah, that's what yeah. she says, but I mean, I- I'm not going to penalize character development because a character is not, you know, brave enough to kill herself in that situation. And because somebody ne- maybe didn't do that. Like, I think that's the thing. If this character didn't do this in real life, it's it would seem false. That would seem disingenuous but, 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 to try to make but, that happen you, in the film. You guys, you guys see how this... this, this this nitty gritty of character that we're talking about is ridiculous, and that's a, that's a fault of the filmmaking. If you have to question a character to that extent, something's wrong with the storytelling. Uh, I, I guess I'm saying I didn't I didn't question the character to that extent. So I, I don't. You should you should because it, it 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 simply isn't logical. It isn't even it isn't even psychologically credible that you mm-hmm. feel that way or do those things. Uh, and we and we could we could go further with you know. On the, on the details throughout the film that I, that I found, many of them, that I found to be not credible, mm-hmm. but, but certainly opportunities for brutality. Well, let, I, me give, it, let me give Devendra an opportunity to talk about some of the stuff that you liked about the movie. <laughs> Devendra, you said well, there was the, a few uh, things. I, I didn't like much. I'm sorry, you said me or Devendra? I, I said Devendra. <laughs> okay. Well, the, I, I did want to mention the final scene again, and then I can talk about something that actually did bug me about the film. But the final scene, I think, yes, it's very sentimental. Yes, it's kind of sappy, but it's also surprisingly just direct for Steve McQueen. Like, there's no, there's no, I don't think there are any major long takes. There's no big visual flourishes. It's just Solomon Northup. He has aged so long. His hair is grayer. He steps in. His children are older, and there's a baby, and that. I don't know, that just really got to me because it also kind of showed how, you know, the film doesn't give us date stamps or anything. It doesn't tell us through that experience how long it's been for him. But then you see that final scene and kind of all hits you at once. I love the idea that, you know, his experience, um, they don't specifically tell you how it felt or how long it felt for him. That some pe- could bother some people. For me, it kind of shows the... Uh, well, except in the title, know, but... Can, yeah. Sure, yes, it's but in, in the title, in the, but the in movie... The language of the movie, I agree. If you, not, do, yeah, yeah. The, you don't know how long he's been there. Um, and I think you seeing that, like, there's, there's just sort of, like, a vacuum that he goes through. You know, he, he is stuck in time in this horrific experience and he doesn't know when he's going to get out of it. And I think you feel that by the end too, because you see him slightly older, you see his kids older and that hurt me. Um, just because it, also, if you think about it, like, yes, you know, the title, you know exactly how long it is. And then you think about how long people actually lived in that time period. And man, for him, for, for that period of time, that's like 20 or 25 years of his life today. Well, I, and that's looking time. Also, I couldn't wait to get the hell out of there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, no credit, no credit for that. Devendra. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing I will say, and yeah. maybe well, you'll agree with me. What did you not like about the movie? Demetra? Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. I know you're uh, a producer I mean, of this wait film. A that's, uh, I, I hear. <laughs> I hear a Hollywood prejudice here. That's not. No. Right. No. No. Wait. I, wait, I wait. Let, let him finish. Let him finish. Devendra, go ahead. I love like I love Brad Pitt by the way. Like I, I do think like he is a, he can be a great actor at times. The way that character was portrayed, that seemed a little ridiculous to me just because like yes, he has this one conversation with Solomon and he gets a letter to him and all of a sudden he's free. I know that actually what happened is like they talked for a while and they sent several letters. So it was more of a prolonged thing. It wasn't just like a magical abolitionist appearing to save Solomon Northup and that's kind of how it appeared in the film. I wish that was maybe drawn out a little more to seem a little more, I don't know, a little more realistic, I guess. I, I agree with you. We're there long enough already. I, 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 I wonder why you <laughs> question Brad Pitt's scene rather than question the scene of the, oh, how should we describe him, uh, the crazy opportunistic white guy who, who Solomon first makes his, his appeal to, the first, the first white guy that Solomon tries to give a letter to. Who is he? Where does he come from? And what happened to him? Yeah, what happened to him? That disappeared. That, I mean, question. they have they that, have like that's, that's more of a detriment to to McQueen's and storytelling than Brad Pitt's appearance. Uh, well, they do explain but, where he comes from and why he's there, but the yeah, what happened to him, I agree. Words, but also, like that, uh, uh, from what I understand of the actual narrative, that's what happened. Like he, Solomon Northam tried to work with this guy to get a message out. The guy read it on him, and then Solomon had to. That's that scene where he tries to convince, uh, you know, Master Epps of what was really going on. Uh, I thought that was a tremendous thing. So yeah, that what didn't seem unbelievable. What happened to the guy? We need to know what happened to the guy. <laughs> Do we? I mean, that, that, that's not his story. To, to me, to me, when to, to 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 allow that kind of hole, that kind of ellipsis, is 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 to do Steve McQueen's work for him. Uh, that that's a that's a flaw. It's a, it's a huge one of the many huge flaws that I see in this movie. I, I'm with Armand uh, on this one. Actually, I do think that's a gaping. Be, that's a gaping I don't, I don't understand, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> because I, we don't need all the blanks filled in for us, like not necessarily. And you also, this guy. One, and you need you <laughs> didn't need that one. <laughs> it's like, if I may say so, because you're questioning Brad Pitt. <laughs> I am questioning, Brad, questioning Brad what exactly happened. Brad Pitt's screen. character raises a question for you, so should the other character. You know I'm questioning what happens on screen, not the absence of anything on screen. Like, that's the thing. I'm questioning the, the text, basically. Uh, All right, well, let's, let's agree text. to disagree. on. I, I found that... Uh, let's Brad, agree to disagree on this one. Let's agree to you disagree You like killing them one. softly, Dave. You must have loved that Brad Pitt scene. De- definitely, definitely. <laughs> um, no, I, I actually... No, Devendra, I agree with you. I think that, okay. that Brad Pitt scene was... Uh, how Brad Pitt is depicted as kind of this magical guy who comes in and saves everyone is not really magical abolitionist. Yeah, yeah. magical abolitionist. And, um, and so and so and so, fellas, what does that tell you about the filmmakers and what they're doing? <laughs> what does that tell you? Well, there's no real way. You, you know what I mean? Like, okay, first of all, they're constrained by reality in terms of how this is actually. No, they're, no, they're not constrained. Okay, by reality. okay, you're right, you're right, you're right. All, they're not constrained by reality. They are hopefully guided in some way by reality. But also, I'm thinking like, okay, what other way could this situation have been resolved other than by, you know, either staging some kind of, you know, prison break or, uh, or someone with more power than Solomon helping him to resolve it? Like, I just don't think there's that many options. Well, one, well, one, one problem is something I, I suggested before, which is, which is the, the film's nihilism. And it's, it's, it's extreme cynicism, uh, because perhaps if, if Steve McQueen and John Ridley were filmmakers of a more spiritual, humanist bent, like, uh, like Charles Burnett, like Spielberg, like Jonathan Demme, uh, the appearance of the Brad, Brad Pitt character could be well understood as providence, and, and absolutely accepted as providence. But Ridley and McQueen are not guys who believe in providence or spirituality or grace. They simply believe in masochism and sadism. So with that extreme cynicism throughout the film, when Brad Pitt, a providential character, appears, uh, some people can't accept it because all of a sudden it seems fake to them. And that's because the filmmakers have not prepared for that kind of character. They've Mm -hmm. simply prepared us for more violence, more brutality, more cynicism. And cynicism wins out because you can't accept Brad Pitt's providential appearance. 
Uh, I don't know if we can't accept it. I think we found it slightly problematic, but I also think it, that... It means you don't accept it. Okay, well, I also think that one of the themes of the movie, or not, I don't know if even theme is the right word, but th- this idea of chance that plays into it, that random chance is what led him into this horrible situation, and that uh, chance occurrence would be what led him out of it. Like that, 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 Sure, you can call that nihilistic or existential or whatever. I think that's fine. But it didn't strike me as, wow, that took me out of the movie too much uh, because I thought it fit in with the rest of the movie that right. we're all at the whims of the gods, you know? And so I don't, um, yeah, I don't, I don't agree that that was a huge flaw. And then, well, if you say that, then I don't understand your problem with Brad Pitt. All right, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a huge problem. It's not a huge problem. But, yeah, okay. there's more like there a minor be, thing. There should be no problem. All right, all right. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll take that feedback, Armin. We'll take that feedback. But I think we've got to wrap things up for today. I think we've been talking for, for quite a while. And uh, as usual, this has been a very educational experience. I also want to point out that um, we actually did talk with Armin White about uh, Django Unchained. It was a while ago. But it was ep- episode 214 of the Slash Filmcast After Dark uh, from last year. So if ah. you want to hear that discussion, you're welcome to go revisit it. But let's wrap things up for today. You can find more of our episodes at SlashFilmcast.com. You can also email us so let us know what you thought of 12 Years a Slave and what you think of the podcast at SlashFilmcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned to hear what we'll be reviewing next week. In the meantime, Armand White, you want to tell people how they can find more of your work? Well, I am... Um the editor and chief film critic for City Arts, a Strauss media publication. So the City Arts website, which is cityarts.info, uh, contains my work. Also, you can go to the New York Film Critics Circle website and, and see the reprints of it there. And I'm uh, also working on a book called The Clash, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Movies.